I would like to welcome you to our first talk of the day. This is John. He is the only person who I've ever approved a machine learning talk for. I am CFP review panel for quite a number of conferences, and I have never approved one of these. So uh, we're all going to give him a really hard time. Ready? Go! All right. Uh, <laughs> thanks. Uh, don't, don't worry, guys. It's not going to be one of those talks. Um, Hey guys, uh, this talk's called Learning to Listen. Um, uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, detecting rogue APs with machine learning, uh, but in a very specific context. Um, this sort of relates to my own personal experience with uh, hacking and giving presentations at conferences and my own journey of how I got here in the first place. Uh, so if you will follow me on this wonderful adventure, uh, I promise we'll have some fun. Um, uh, so I'm John Dunlap. I, I work for a company called uh, GDS Security. We're based out of well New York principally, but also uh, London, a uh, few other handful of places we have offices. Um, I, I work on security research, reverse engineering, pen testing, whole, whole nine yards, everything. I do a lot of research. I'm actually doing like three talks at DEF CON this year, so having a really fun time. Um, and I swear. This will not be a buzzword laden talk. Uh, I promise I will <laughs> not say all of these words in succession and confuse everybody with with like crazy dense machine learning talk. Although, let's see, do, 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 I did not say a AI revolution or Keras or APT or cyber. So that's good on me. Um, so uh, who here knows Gabe Bryan, the like master of Wi-Fi hacking? Um, if you guys know Gabe, he's like uh, really, really into Wi-Fi hacking. He talked at uh, DEF CON uh, two years ago and last year and this year. He's, uh, he already did his talk in the big presentation hall. Uh, but he talks a lot about really complex like enterprise EAP attacks. And um, the story of, of Gabe and his attacks uh, has a lot to do with the genesis for this talk. So um, I met Gabe when I was a slightly younger security engineer, and uh, he was really new at my company. And um, within like a month of joining on the, as his like first security engineer job, he uh, came up with this research for detecting rogue APs. And it really inspired me that he had like the gumption to just go for it with very little experience. And uh, sort of ended up inspired me to go and give talks and do research in a way. So I thought I would uh, return the favor to Gabe for inspiring me to start my uh, speaking career as it was by mm, sort of tearing apart one of his tools, playfully, lovingly. Um, and his tool um, is called uh, EAP, uh, well, his good tool is called EAP Hammer. He has a lot of, a lot of good tools. Um, you should try EAP Hammer, it's really hot. Uh, it helps you do enterprise EAP attacks. Um, but two years ago, he wrote a different tool, and this is kind of the subject of this talk. Um, uh, it's called Sentry Gun. And the idea with Sentry Gun uh, was he wanted a way to monitor uh, for rogue AP attacks using little um, uh, host beacon devices. And uh, the basic idea with uh, Sentry Gun was you would deploy a bunch of little... Um, monitors with antennas uh, all around your um, whatever area you're trying to protect. And they would listen uh, passively um, for probe requests, 802.11 probe requests. And um, they would measure uh, against a predefined statistic. Uh, they would measure if the signal strength was greater or lower than uh, the predefined statistic. And, and then that would get sent to a server. And when that was violated, it would give you the ability to slay the rogue AP by sending some kind of deauth attack against it or uh, some kind of DOS attack against it. Um, and it was part of my job working at GDS at the time. I was a little more senior than him. I got to review his slides and offer critiques and stuff. And um, uh, I, <laughs> I got to have a good time giving him a hard time. But since he was so inspiring to me, I thought I would return to that and see if I really could uh, outdo, his, outdo his methodology. So yeah, Gabe, Gabe wants to take out rogue APs. That's pretty metal. If you didn't know, Gabe plays in like a metal band. He's like a very uh, heavy metal kind of person. Uh, here's the Sentry Gun uh, GitHub repo. 
Uh, if you haven't seen it, you should give it a shot. It has a nice little web interface. I think it's cute that it lets you uh, DDoS the rogue APs. So uh, it also helps you locate them. And the location uh, information is based on uh, the differing signal strength of the various uh, antenna sensors you have um, in the room. So you've got a uh, speci spatially distributed sensor array. Uh, but you have to do benchmarking of this uh, sensor array for your trusted APs uh, in a trusted environment, which kind of stinks. Uh, because you might not have that trusted environment if you're in a public place. Uh, you have to find a day when no one's in that room. Um, now, what is that statistic that we're using for figuring out if the signal is out of band? Uh, it's basically um, arithmetic mean, right? So the way uh, Gabe's tool works is it samples 15 packets uh, exactly uh, and takes the signal strength of each of those and um, does a mean on that. And if you're uh, past a certain deviation uh, up or down from that, then you're a rogue AP. Uh, and only really considers you for rogue AP status if you have uh, the same SSID and VSSID uh, as the trusted AP. So you have a white list. And um, if you come up with a weird signal strength and you're on the same SSID and VSSID as the stuff on the white list, uh, then you're considered uh, a rogue AP and uh, put up for dosing. <laughs> um, and this actually, you know, uh, worked pretty well in pr uh, practice. Um, he was able to uh, find and eliminate rogue APs in his tests. And um, using the multi-sensor setup, he was able to physically locate the attackers. Um, that said, you know, when he first gave the, like, pitch of the talk to me, I was like, really? Just the mean? Just the mean? Like, see, like, I'm one of, one of those engineers, like, I, I'm always trying to build a Rube Goldberg machine, and like I instantly thought to myself, like that's not enough math. That cannot possibly be enough math. And it, it you know, and hasn't someone done this? Is too easy. Like so, someone's tried this before. Um, but you know, I had to give game my respect because it like worked really well in practice. Um, so I, I demanded more. I want more math. Uh, I want more features. Uh, I want a deeper characteriz characterization of attackers, and um, possibly. Uh, greater accuracy because although I was wearing practice because I've run Gabe's tool a couple times and I saw him uh, two years ago, I think a little bit this year, he, he gave, uh, he actually tried his tool out uh, at B-Sides. Uh, they let him run it in an active threat environment and found a lot of rogue APs. Um, but we, what was never established was like, what is the false positive level of this tool? What is the accuracy level of this tool? So I wanted to establish those things on my own and see if we couldn't find a way to come up with a better, more adaptive method uh, for characterizing these kinds of attacks. Uh, and you know, maybe utilize a little more of the like academic literature on finding rogue APs, which is kind of interesting. Um, so how about machine learning? You know, because when we're talking about uh, we have two very similar signals, and we want to classify them. Why um, machine learning is very good at classifying things as like one of the primary things it does. Uh, so I thought I would develop some kind of classifier to classify these signals. And even if I didn't know the like particular function that made these signals different from each other, the machine learning could find that out for me. Um, so my idea was to add machine learning algorithms to Gabe's tool to train a model to better identify and classify attackers. Uh, and you know, try to find those signals that didn't work well with Gabe's algorithm. And uh, maybe in the future predict some recurring attacks and locations. I, and I, I got sort of about half of that stuff in my research. Um, I, I'm really proud of the results I got. Um, but we'll show you what I did get and did not get. But first, let's talk about prior work. You know, um, the first time I saw Gabe's presentation, I said to myself, someone's had tried this before. Um, and the answer was no. <laughs> no one really had uh, done a practical implementation quite like this, actually. There are a lot of close calls and a lot of, um, you know, if you read a lot of uh, papers from journals, there's a lot of people proposing algorithms, uh, but not a lot of practical tests and benchmarks, uh, which sometimes sucks. Um, so we'll talk about that uh, in a second. Um, we already got that. And so the first uh, paper we'll talk about is uh, Yang, Song, and Gu. Um, and this is from 2012. Uh, 
active user side evil twin access point detections using statistical techniques. So this is the first thing that came close to both me and Gabe's uh, sort of idea. And you know, it's, it's not quite machine learning, it's statistics, but sometimes that's the same thing. Like Bayesian statistics could be machine learning, right? Um, and the idea is that we're going to uh, define a way to find um, rogue APs uh, using a number of uh, their own invented uh, statistics, including hop differentiation technique, trained mean matching, uh, sequential probability ratio tests. That's that's a term they made up. Um, and uh, we're going to use kind of a client side approach. Um, so this would be run on the workstation. We're worried about connecting to the rogue AP. Uh, and that's, that's kind of like a differentiating thing you'll see in a lot of these papers. I wanted to uh, limit my options for the techniques I was using to things that were essentially similar to Gabe's approach. Um, if you look into the market for uh, rogue AP detection, there are uh, a bunch of variations on the overall architecture. And in enterprise stuff, the most common thing you see is basically uh, a box that's connected to both the LAN and the Wi-Fi that can measure late latencies and see if something has a greater latency uh, based on measuring its relationship to both the LAN and the Wi-Fi. Um, uh, I avoided that purposefully uh, because that's not what Gabe's tool does. Gabe, Gabe's tool is a passive one that doesn't need a whole lot of intrusive access to the network. Uh, and you'll see what I mean in a second in terms of options that I uh, sort of left by the wayside just because it wasn't similar to Gabe's tool. I wanted to improve on Gabe's idea specifically. Um, and sort of extracting um, ideas that are important from this Yang Song and Gu is there's a lot of uh, ideas floating around about measuring hops in terms of like maybe we'll connect to this rogue AP and see if it has more hops than it should have. If the rogue AP is connected to the AP, it's connected to the WAN or something like that, we will have one extra hop than we should have. Um, but that involves like some intrusive access. We, we actually have to uh, associate to that rogue AP. And, uh, again, that's not in the spirit of Gabe's tool, so we're not going to do it. Um, but the measuring of latencies and whatnot, that is a good idea, and we should think about that. Uh, here's another uh, paper from 2013, Kim, Seo, Sean, and Moon. A novel approach to detection of mobile rogue access points. Uh, again, we're measuring latencies for round trip time analysis. Um, this is a good idea. You know, maybe our rogue AP will have much greater latency. Um, and you know, they make the very modern inference that a rogue AP will likely be connected to some kind of 3G wireless. You know, this is very much going along the idea. If you've ever been on a red team with a jump box or something, you usually will have something connected to the victim network on one side and 3G on the other side so you can exfil your data without being dependent on the victim network. Uh, and obviously 3G is going to have a great deal of latency and if you can measure that latency occurring when associating to the endpoint, then that's a good uh, indication that you're using a rogue AP. Uh, but there's a catch there and that catch is uh, that you have to associate to the AP and that's not in the uh, spirit of Gabe's talk but gets us thinking about time and round trip time analysis and that kind of thing. And we can start to think about techniques that involve this that might be applicable to uh, the tool that uh, Gabe's written, I'm writing, etc. Here's another one. Uh, Jana and Kassara on fast and accurate detection of unauthorized wireless access points using clock skews. Um, now this is the idea that uh, every device is going to have a slight aberration in the clock time as time goes on. The time will g slowly get off base and that we can actually detect that off of the timestamps uh, sent in um, packets. So we read those timestamps and connect them to our system's time and see how they uh, gradually deviate. We can get an idea for uh, how far off their clock is. Um, this is a good paper because it, it gives a, a decent algorithm for doing that. Uh, but in general, you can just um, subtract those two values and get uh, a, an idea for what the clock skew is and this will be different device to device. And that's kind of really what we want to do. We want to like uh, differentiate um, not, not just the signal strength because um, that, that, can, that can be iffy, um, but the behavior of the Wi-Fi card of the device will be different um, device to device. And you know, hopefully being more general about it, uh, we could uh, find stuff that's interesting. Um, you know, one technique I, I left out of this I don't have a slide for, unfortunately, is um, a lot of people are working on ways to measure uh, delays based on 802.11 protocols where there, there is like a mandatory delay between certain actions and that will be slightly different uh, based on uh, the device itself. And again, uh, that can be problematic because uh, you need very high resolution time measurement for that to work out. 
Uh, so what about learning? So we're going to do um, a machine learning type experiment to see if we can't use what we just learned from those papers a little bit to design uh, a detection algorithm that has a uh, good, uh, good false positive rate and whatnot and detect these things uh, pretty well. Uh, so we're going to pick some side channels. Uh, we're going to use the clock skew, uh, signal strength, timestamp. Um, and uh, we'll put those together as sort of our data set to try and differentiate uh, the APs. Uh, next, we have to pick a good machine learning algorithm. Uh, so uh, what are our requirements for this algorithm? So uh, first of all, this is inherently time series data. And what that means, uh, if you know, you, you're not familiar with that term, is that um, the signal strengths uh, uh, we are sampling uh, shouldn't be viewed independently. They should be viewed as a, uh, as a sequence of events uh, because they could be oscillating in a sine wave type form and that could be more distinctive than the signal strength itself. It could be that, you know, um, the way that the uh, uh, Wi-Fi card on this particular device scans only peaks every seven seconds or something like that. It's a very simplified way of looking at it, but it's something that a machine learning algorithm could easily detect, but wouldn't be so obvious in our um, check the average signal strength type situation that we have um, in Gabe's original implementation. Um, uh, we also want something that can work with multiple features because we want to stuff in that, that clock skew and that timestamp, right? Uh, so we want to put in that as a vector that's going to be learned uh, in a time series. And we want to be doing something that can uh, do uh, classification where we, we're going to label our examples ahead of time and say, you know, this is what a rogue AP looks like. This is what our... Uh, our uh, nominal AP looks like. It's going to differentiate and tell us a, a good estimate of how confident it is that um, uh, this is actually the rogue AP. Um, and then another thing to keep in mind is that this could be a model, if the attacker is aware of it, that they might be able to adversarially uh, influence, right? If, they, if they're able to affect our training data, right? Uh, you know, uh, Again, uh, in my case, uh, one of the downsides for this is that we have to collect our training data ahead, ahead of time. And in my design of the algorithm, as we'll see, you have to uh, collect training data for each, um, each endpoint individually to characterize it, which isn't such a big deal, but it kind of sucks. Uh, it does kind of mean you, you might be able to do uh, this characterization uh, offline in an isolated room and not in the like, production network. Uh, because we're just looking for, we're characterizing the behavior of the card itself. Um, so that should be uh, relatively fine. Um, and another thing to keep in mind is that we want to be sure that we're doing our training correctly because uh, our adversaries might be very different. They might be heterogeneous. They might not all behave the same. We, we don't want to accidentally train our network to detect one particular adversary or our example adversary. We want to be looking for the difference between the nominal uh, AP and any adversary, not just uh, the one we train for. So I uh, uh, went for a type of null network called uh, LSTM, or long short term memory. Um, it's a type of recurrent neural network, and uh, I'm not going to get through the like 30 minutes of explaining uh, to like fully characterize what that means, but it's a type of neural network that can uh, keep track of, of long term events selectively. Um, so recurrent neural networks have the power to look back a couple steps. Long-term, short-term ones can hold on to a little bit of data it finds interesting over time. And um, this is good for us because we don't know the scale of the aberrations that we're looking for in the signal or in the timestamps and whatnot. The LSTM will help us figure that out. Um, I considered a couple of other things. Uh, one of the to-do list things uh, I had for this is, is trying um, adversarial networks, for instance, familiar with those. Um, but it turned out that the LSTM works so well, uh, I was not highly motivated to try other neural networks, uh, as we'll see in a second. Um, here's like a, a Wikipedia definition for an LSTM if you're interested. Again, there's a lot of technological uh, data science stuff to uh, to digest there, um, but what's important to know is that we're able to detect sequences in the not just the short term but the long term, which is nice. That's what we want. Uh, so when we talk about neural networks and doing machine learning, we talk about features or parameters, um, and I used uh, four. 
So we have a training label, uh, we have our signal strength, a timestamp, and the time the packet is received. And I didn't explicitly put clock skew in there because I wanted to see if the neural network would be able to uh, pick that up, that relationship up on its own. Uh, and I'm pretty certain it did. <laughs> um, but in the future, I might explicitly put in there a couple of uh, other side channels that I find. All right? um, uh, I implemented about 2,000 rounds of training, uh, which isn't very much. Uh, we're talking about like maybe 30 seconds of machine learning training. I didn't have to use Keras or you know, uh, Google Compute or anything like that. It's, it's really pretty light. And then I had to uh, implement some protocols to avoid overtraining. Now, overtraining is, again, that problem that you run into in machine learning, where if your examples are too specific, uh, we might not get a general enough algorithm out of it. We might, we might train only for that one adversary, right? If we don't have a whole variety of adversaries, uh, then we might overtrain and only detect the one. Um, and uh, luckily, uh, we have some methodologies uh, for picking up on whether that's happening or not. And so uh, to give the results of uh, my machine learning experiment, here is the TensorBoard graph. And this is a, um, to give you a little background, I did this all in TensorFlow, uh, which is uh, like Google's uh, uh, machine learning API that lets you implement these neural networks very easily. It's got a lot of predefined bones. Uh, and TensorBoard is its like automated visualization representation type setup. Uh, and uh, I got about 90% accuracy on the predictions. So about 90% of the packets I put through there, it correctly identified as being uh, rogue or not. And uh, if you look in there, on the right side of the graph, uh, we have the accuracy slash cost uh, uh, graph, which basically just indicates to us that we're probably not overtraining. Uh, usually it's an indication that like, if we're in an overtraining situation, that graph will remain stagnant or it will go up. Uh, so uh, the graph is basically saying that uh, the neural network is getting better with each generation, more accurate, which is what we'd expect if we had a proper setup. So uh, every time I run this, it gets better, uh, and it has a very well, relatively high um, accuracy rate. We're talking machine learning. We could be much higher if I wanted it to be, like, really optimize it. Uh, but here in this case, it's pretty impressive. Um, so we have about 90% accuracy. And uh, we're able to detect uh, recurring patterns in the data. And we have no signs of overtraining, which is pretty freaking sweet, if you ask me. <laughs> uh, and now we have a model that we can apply uh, to live data. And, uh, and, and run it and see uh, what it does. Uh, but now we have to ask ourselves, um, did we do better than before? And uh, after calculating uh, Gabe's false positive rate is about 50%, something like that, which is in practice pretty good when you're talking about each individual packet. If you miss a couple, that's fine. Uh, because you, you're, you're meant to go and do something about it the moment you get an alert. Um, whereas my uh, false positive rate is maybe 10%, which is pretty freaking good. Um, you know, one of the reasons that uh, he had the high false positive rate is that he, remember, he has to train ahead of time on the, uh, the mean of the signal strength. And that actual signal strength on the network, as time goes on, that mean in reality will change, but we've trained it to uh, just the beforehand mean, if that makes sense. Um, so uh, with more parameters in the future, we might be able to do even better, but I'm, I'm pretty impressed with 90%. Um, I showed this to Gabe maybe 10 minutes ago, and he, he lost his mind. He's like, oh my god, you made my tool perfect. Um, and uh, believe it or not, that's, that's just about it. I finished a little early here, and I'd be willing to take questions about uh, the approach, the algorithm, machine learning. I hope I, I, uh, I, I kept this fairly buzzword free. Go for it. Hey, so you were talking about monitoring, uh, analyzing monitoring signal training, trying to detect rogue APs. What case are you saying, I don't know, like a place like Houston or something, where there's a lot of public traffic throughout the workspace, mm -hmm. and so the rogue APs are actually being transmitted in the workspace? Does that mean that, like, trying to look at the signal signal really works? Because the rogue APs actually in similar places to where GPU APs are? 
Yeah. So, I, you know, that's one of the problems I identified with um, Gabe's original algorithm is that the signal strength in absolute terms per packet is unreliable. And even in a relatively quiet network, uh, I tested this with a bunch of Raspberry Pis and, uh, you know, a couple of legit APs I had. Um, for no good reason, that signal strength will vary a great deal. Um, and that mean, that average, will vary a great deal. Um, but what appears to be um, detectable is the fluctuations. Um, and adding that timestamp and receive time together uh, helps the neural network have a very high uh, success rate in identifying these rogue attacks. Go for it. Yeah, um, so and that's sort of the next step of this research. I didn't quite get to that, but there are some really good um, papers on on using uh, varying RSSI and signal strength to to locate people. And specifically, um, it didn't make it in here because I didn't finish it. Um, I wanted to do that without having multiple sensors. Uh, that was more interesting to me. And there, there's even like a prototype like antenna on a servo thing to help <laughs> make that happen. Uh, another paper I left out of this, uh, which would have been, I should have put in here, uh, is that the people are working on uh, doing similar things to what I'm doing with the SDR, but, or not with SDR, with RSSI, uh, but using SDRs to fingerprint the, in a more general sense, fingerprint the uh, radio signal. Because um, if you're not thinking just about uh, 802.11 packets and you're thinking about uh, the actual shape of the radio signal, there's a much more characteristic thing to learn there. Um, so uh, maybe in the next couple of months I'll, gr I'll grab an SDR and try that out because it, it seems like that's a very good ongoing method. Anybody else? I am releasing the code soonish. Uh, right now I'm in the, in the process of cleaning it up and uh, integrating it into Gabe's uh, web front end. Um, so that you can use it without asking me a billion questions about how to set it up. But yes, uh, watch my Twitter. It should pop up soon. Uh, I'm one of those skittish coders who is embarrassed of, I, I, <laughs> I don't want someone uh, in a future job interview to be like, why did you write your Python like that? Uh, so soon, I promise. Uh, it should be, it was at the front of the talk. It's John Dunlap 2. Here, I will. I will give you the front. Yeah, there you go. And, okay. Any other questions? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> no, no. I do have another one at one in the biohacking village. If you want to see me, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm inserting... Uh, Encrypted data into living organisms. No, really. <laughs> okay, anybody else? All right, guys, it's been great. <laughs>